Good day, everyone. This is Deva Brata once again, and today we will be jumping into a new chapter that is called recursion. So, what is recursion? Recursion is basically the extension of function. So, basically, when a function call itself, then we call this feature as a recursion. So, we will try to explore that thing in today's class. And I have segregated the whole topic of recursion into three parts. So today I will do the first part that is the starting recursion. We will understand how recursion works, what is recursion and using recursion, we will create some for loops. Okay, some not for loops, some loops and those loop will be equivalent or will be same like the for loops. So we will solve all the loop chapters we have already done like for series, for application, we will solve those problems once again, but this time with using recursion. For the next few classes, next two or three classes, for loop will be banned. Okay, we will not going to use for loop. We will do everything using recursion. Okay, so obviously to jump into recursion part, first you need to have a good idea of function. So I will, I will prefer like as a prerequisite of this class, it will be good if you can just go through the function class once. And I think that will be enough. And after that, obviously you need some time in your hand so that you can practice all the programs by yourself. Okay. It is important because recursion is something uh, like something different than all the chapters. So now if we target first all the four series programs with recursion, but before that, let me uh, revise a bit uh, what we have done in function chapter, just a bit. So if I create a new file called recursion demo and let me create a class and the initials what required to write a program like public static void main. So now if you can remember whatever we have done in our function class, suppose if I create a function like uh, name with name India, say, and a simple function, I'm not going into some, uh, some critical functions. We have done a lot of thing in our function classes. Just if I just give a revise on that, if I, if I try to recap whatever we have done at, the, at that class, and suppose if I take a simple example, like I'm trying to print in India function, I can, I'm just simply printing, hi, I am in India, that's all. So if I call this function from the main function, obviously, hi, I am in India will be printed in the output screen. So if I try to execute this program, it will simply print, hi, I am in India. So it is quite normal. So now if I introduce three different functions here, just a small recap, whatever we have done in function. Suppose let me introduce another function called Asia and here I want to print, I am in Asia. And here, if I introduce another function called world and if I write, I am in world here, and if I call all those function one by one from the main function, then obviously you, in the output screen, you will be able to see like the first end sentence is hi, I am in India. After that, it will call the Asia function and you will, you will be able to see hi, I am in Asia. After that, it will call world function and you will be able to see hi, I am in world. So let me do that. So it is quite obvious you will be getting this type of output. Now, if I make the things a bit weird or suppose let me call Asia function from inside of India function. Because if I am in India, obviously that means I am in Asia. Obviously that also means I am in the world. Inside Asia function, let me call the world function. So if I am in Asia, that means also I am in India, I am in world. So now if I call India function, what will happen? What will be the output? So if I call India function, so first it will print, simply print, I am in India and it will call Asia and world function 
after that. So if I go to a notepad, so it will first print I am in India. And after that, it will call Asia function. Inside Asia function, you can see there is two lines. I am in Asia and world. So obviously, Asia function will call these two lines. I am in Asia and it will call world function. You can see. Now, world function, what will do world function? World function will print this line. I, I am in world. So in world function, this line will be printed. I am in world. And after that, we have a separate world function again. Again, this line will be printed. I am in world. So what will happen again? First, I am in India will be printed. Then it will call Asia. From Asia, it will go into that part. I am in Asia will be print and it will call world function from inside of Asia function. So I am in world will be printed. After that, on the completion of this line, it will go into this part. And in world function, it will print I am in world once again. So all together, four lines will be printed India, Asia, world, and world. So it proves we can call a function from anywhere. We can call a function from another function as well. So if I run this, it will show an output like India, Asia, world, and world. So it proves we can call function from anywhere. So if you are not able to understand this uh, code, let me make it very simple. Let me only put India function. Let me call India function only. And in, from inside India function, I will call India another time. So if I call India here, what will happen? It will go into this function and it will print, I am in India. And after that, it will call itself once again. So again, it will call this function, I am in India will be printed. And again, it will call itself. Again, I am in India will be printed and it will call once again itself. And accordingly, a loop will be created. A loop will be created here. It will be an infinite loop. It will keep calling itself and it will keep printing as hi, I'm in India, hi, I'm in India, kind of that. If I try to close that, because it will be an infinite loop. Okay, I, I don't know if I'm able to close this or not. Let me reset this from here. Yeah, I think it is stopped now. Yeah. So if I go to the program, so I can see it is creating a loop. But yeah, obviously, uh, I do not have any control on this loop yet. Okay, so let me do something else. Let me provide some value to this loop. Let me provide the value one. And I will receive that as a parameter inside the function like index. And now what I will do? Instead of printing hi, I am in India, I will try to print hi x. And again, I will pass this value to the next function. So if I run that, so simply it will print high one, high one, high one, kind of that. Let me try to do that. Let me try to do that. It will print high one, high one, high one, kind of that. Let me close this out. Ah, it is it is tough to control the infinite loop. Okay, it is closed somehow. So now, okay, let me do one thing. Let me change the name of the function from India to a method. A function or a method, I can use a name like myth okay so it will do the same thing i have just changed the name of the function only so now what will i do for the next turn i will increment the value of one suppose i am sending one it is printing one and after for the next run it will pass the value two next time it will print two and for the next run it will pass the value three and accordingly if i take a look what will happen in this case? So it will create again and another infinite loop and it will print a series like high one, high two, high three, kind of. I can see uh, high few thousand has been printed. Okay. So I can see a loop is in making, but I do not have any control on that. So how to control this kind of loop? What I can do, I can simply write a if. I will try to iterate this loop until the value of x is less than 10. Suppose if it is less than 10, then, then only it will call the function another time. If it is somehow x become 11, 
so it will do nothing it will not go inside the if so that it cannot call itself once again and the loop should be stopped okay the loop is creating because it is calling itself so i put the conditions inside a if statement that means if the value of x is become if the value of x becomes 11 then it will not go inside this if statement so it will not going to print anything it is not going to call itself so the loop will be stopped so if i check it should print 1 to 10 and i should have a control for the very first time on this kind of loop yeah so now it is no more infinite and i can see the numbers or figures are printing very properly so now if i make some small change and if i want to make that same like a for loop program what we have done in our chapter if you can remember in chapter 3.1 we have done some for series program so today's agenda will be after today's class it is the first class of recursion we will be able to solve all the programs of for series and for application but this time without using for loop without using for loop this time our target is to solve this thing solve this loop using recursion recursion is nothing but this loop is being called recursion where a function is calling itself multiple times and it is creating a loop so to make it finite to make it uh, to have a control over the recursion we always have a if statement we always need to put a if statement inside the function otherwise it, it keep calling itself and it will create an infinite loop so to make it finite always a if statement is needed okay so now what i will do i will try to print them in a line more like a series the series we have we used to print in 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 the chapter 3.1 for series so we are doing the same thing here so now we are able to print a proper series now so now if i go to the problems listed in this slide suppose it is asking for a series like 3 7 11 15 until 50 how can i print that we have already done that using for loop but here how can i print it so i will pass first value as a 3 so it will print 3 here just understand it correctly and every time on the next turn i will send it 3 plus 4 that is 7 and it will iterate till the value of x is under 50 if i run so it is 3 7 11 15 kind of till 47 means under 50 got it so i again if i explain i am sending the first value as 3 it is printing 3 next time it is passing 7 3 plus 4 next time it is printing 7 and passing 11 next time it is printing 11 and passing 15 and it is keep iterating like that and creating the for loop i will do that until the value of x is 50 okay suppose now i user wants to input this value so i will introduce a scanner class I will introduce a scanner class and I will pop up like a message should be pop up like okay enter the limit and it will enter in 10 equals to sc dot next int and uh, okay scanner class doesn't exist obviously I have to introduce something like import java dot util dot star yeah now it should work now how can I send this value in into this part? Because I want to control the limit. I will, user will tell like, like until which value it should print. So how can I pass the value of n into this part? So only way is pass the value as a parameter. So I will, I will pass this value in as a parameter. I will receive that and I will use that value here. And obviously, for the next turn as well, I have to keep passing this value. Because in recursion, you cannot declare something like n equals to 0, something like that. If I declare that, every time it will be declared like that. Every time, every time, every time it is calling itself and every time it is being introduced by n equals to 0. So if you want to pass some value, if you want to use some value, you need to pass on those values. So here I'm passing n 
it is being received here as n i am using that and again on the next turn i have to pass it otherwise it will not exist so if i compile and if i try to run now the control is in my hand i can say like okay print it till 40 so this series will be printed till 40 got it so we had similar kind of control when we used to do programs using for loop okay so it is an alternative of for loop so if i why we are learning recursion it is not because it is in our syllabus we have we will i will show you in the next few classes why recursion is important okay so the next program it is saying in the similar way i will try to create the loop uh, like here it is saying 3 7 11 15 the same series but this time 10 terms so how can i build it for 10 terms so i can pass one extra value here one and here i can receive that as a so a will control the loop and every time a will increase by one so the control is now in a's hand so a will be keep iterating like one two three four kind of that and i will check until it is suppose less than 10 i have entered enter the number of terms suppose someone has entered like 10 so a will keep checking if it is less than 10 or not and x will increment independently so a will be like one two three four five six like that and it will check if it is less than 10 or not meanwhile 10 values will be printed and x will flow independently so if i run this program it should print the 10 terms if i show you suppose let me give 10 terms so it will print 3 7 11 15 19 kind of the 10 terms if you can remember in for loop classes in the chapter 3.1 in this playlist we used to do the same thing so we used to control the number of terms using a so here as well you can do the same thing okay so uh, okay, sorry. If I go to the number three, it is saying three minus seven, 11 minus 15. Means second term, fourth term, sixth term will be printed as negative. So all the even position numbers will be printed as negative. So how to find the even position number? A is incrementing like one, two, three, four, kind of that. So I can simply write whenever the value of A is even, I can print it negative whenever the value of a is odd for the first position for the third position it will print the positive number positive value of x and all the time if it is even or odd if it is positive or negative every time i'll be passing this value like plus four x will be plus four and a will be incremented by one so it is just about printing a positive number or a negative number. So in case of even position, I am printing negative with the same series. I'm not changing anything in the series. So the same series, sometimes I'm printing positive, sometimes I'm printing negative. That's all. Got it. So, okay, before passing into the next program, I can, I want to show you another approach for the question number two. If you can remember the question number two, if I go back, into the question number two. Question number two was, I can see three, seven, 11, 15. Without passing this A, I can also do it in some other way. Let me delete A. Let me delete it. I will not going to use this third parameter. I can simply write until N greater than equals to one. And every time N equals to N minus one. What does it mean? So I will pass N as 10. So it will check until n is greater than 1. And every time it will become 9. After that, it will become 8. After that, it will become 7. Kind of that. If I show you a dry run, if I show you a dry run, so suppose I'm calling uh, myth 3 and 10. Suppose myth 3 and 10. So what it will do, it will be received, x will be received as 3 x will be received as 3 and 10 will be received as n. So next turn, it will check if n is greater than 1. Yes, then it will print x, means 3 will be printed. And it will call 3 plus 4, means 7. And 10 
minus one nine. Next turn seven will be printed and it will call math eleven and eight. So next turn it will print eleven and it will call fifteen and seven. Kind of that. So until this value of n becomes one. So meanwhile it will help to print ten different numbers. So if I run this thing, it will print ten different numbers because n is flowing reversely from 10 to 1. So if I input 10, it will be printing 10 different numbers and without the value, without the help of the variable A. Got it? If you are not able to understand anything, just let me know in the comment section. Or you can send me a mail as well. And if we are doing any offline classes, obviously we will meet here and you can tell me what are the problems you are facing with these examples. And if you are still not able to understand this thing, I will be able to present some more examples on this type okay so if i go to the question number four the same series we have done in four series chapter so if i want to present this thing let me use okay let me send one this time and i will not think about this term it will automatically print n terms so what i will focus on how to go into the next value from one how can i reach into reach to 11 so it is simply x into 10 plus 1. It is a mathematical thing. It means 1 into 10 plus 1 becomes 11. If you think in a calm mind, 10 into 11 into 10 plus 1 becomes 111. And it will provide, it will generate the number of that series. So if I compile and if I run, suppose this time if I enter 5 terms, say, so it will print 5 terms like this. Hope you are able to understand. If not, I have some more problems in my slide. So suppose now it is the time for Fibonacci series, 10 terms. So I, again, I will not audit. I am not audit about the 10 terms. It will be printed automatically by using N by that feature. But now I have to send two values, 0 and 1. So suppose first value will be received by X and second value will be received by Y, say. And now this time I will print X. And for the next turn, I will pass y in place of x and x plus y in place of y. What I'm doing, let me first present that using a dry run. So first I am sending math 0, 1 and n. I'm not caring about n. It is 10 for the time being, say. So this value is being called as x. This value is y and this value is n. So, first turn it is printing zero, obviously, it is printing zero. And it is sending for the next turn, it is sending y. You can see it is sending y, x plus y. That means we are printing x as zero here. And after that, after printing zero, what I'm doing here, I'm sending one. And here, I'm sending zero plus one. That means one itself. And obviously here I'm printing a less value nine. So next turn, it is printing one. First, it is printing the value of X. That is one because this is X. This is Y in next turn. So it is printing one. And after that, whenever it is calling something, it is calling Y here because this is the value of Y. And after that, X plus Y for the next run, it will send one plus one and it is eight. So one plus one means it is two. So in the next turn, it will simply print one because the value of X is one. And for the next turn, it is sending the value of Y here two. you can see here, it is sending Y and X plus Y. So here the value of Y is two. So it is sending two and X plus Y means one plus two and N minus one, obviously. So it will print for the next turn three. 2, 3, and 7. So the value of x is 2. So it will pr quickly print the value 2. And for the next run, it will send math 3 because the value of y is 3. And after that, x plus y means 2 plus 3. So that means it will send 5. And you can see accordingly, the series is being printed here. 0 was being printed. So 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, kind of that. So if I run this series, if I run this series, it should print 
the Fibonacci series up to 10 terms. So suppose if I give 10, so it, it is printing Fibonacci series up to 10 terms. In case of any single doubt, just let me know. Let me know. I will try to provide some more examples uh, uh, via the comment section or I will try to arrange something in offline or I, I will check. Just let me know if you are not able to understand. And if you are able to understand, I think it is, it is quite good. So if I, if I proceed with the example, suppose now this time someone is asking about sum of Fibonacci series. They do not want to print the series itself. They want to print the sum. So how to do that? Again, if you want to deal with the sum, you need to pass on one extra variable because here we cannot declare something like in sum equals to zero. If I declare that, just try to understand this function is calling itself one again and again and again. So every time, whenever it is calling itself, the sum will be introduced as zero. So there will not be any benefit we will be getting we cannot store any value inside sum because every time it will be restarted from zero. So I will not do this kind of thing. Rather than I will be pa keep passing on the one extra variable and that will try to hold the sum. So let me put another parameter called sum. And what I will do here, instead of printing the value of X, I will try to put that inside sum. Sum equals to sum plus X. And I will pass that sum for the next run. And it will go on and go on and on. Whenever the value of n is completed, means all the 10 terms will be completed, then it will go for the else for the first time. And in else, I will try to print the sum variable. Obviously, I'm not going to call the function myth once again. If I call the function myth once again from here, it will again create a loop. It, it will again go for a loop. So I'm not going to call the function once again. I will simply print the sum and the loop will be ended as I'm not calling any more function. So until it is iterating 10 times, it will be collecting the sum. It will be collecting the sum. So whenever 10 terms will be completed, it will go inside else statement and whatever we have gathered inside some variable, that, va that value will be printed simply. And I'm not going to call any more myth method so that the, it will not create the loop any, anymore. So if I run, sorry, if I run, if I compile and if I run, it should print the 10 terms of, the sum of 10 terms of Fibonacci series and it is 88. You can make some changes, a smarter move. You can, it is, it is not like, you, if you want, you can also send this sum plus X directly here. There is no meaning to store the value and pass it to the next turn. So I can simply pass this sum plus X into the next turn directly. Because if I send sum plus X, that will also be re received inside the variable sum in the next turn, in the next iteration. So either you can write sum equals to sum plus X or you can directly pass sum plus X for the next turn and it will receive sum. It will be received by sum. So it also means sum equals to sum plus x because I am sending sum plus x inside sum. Okay, but if you are not comfortable with this approach, you can simply write sum equals to sum plus x and pass sum for the next iteration. Okay, so if I go for the last program of this slide, sum of 3, 7, 11, 15, 50, that program. So if I control Z, type control Z, uh, I'm not ready to write the program somehow if i can get back that program so i think let me first print that program i forgot uh, means let me first print okay sorry here i have to make some changes yeah i think this is the program which is printing uh 3 7 11 something like that so if i run it should print uh, suppose if I uh, give 10 terms, uh, it is going to infinite loop. Okay, sorry. I have to make some changes. I am forgetting probably something. Okay, I have to do n minus 1. Yeah. So first, let me, whenever someone is asking for uh, printing the sum of a series, first, it is important to print the series. So yeah, now the series is being printed. Now I can easily move into that direction. This is what our... Uh, second program, I guess. Yeah, it was our second program. 
3, 7, 11, 15, 10 terms. So now someone is looking for the sum. So first it is important to print the series itself. So now I am able to print the series. Now sum will be easier to incorporate. So if I send a value zero, and if I introduce a new parameter called sum here, and instead of printing the value of X, what I'm doing, I'm just passing the value as sum plus X. It will be received by the next sum. And again, it will pass sum plus X and it will be received by another sum. And it will go on and on and on. Whenever all the iteration is completed, I will simply print the value of sum. That's all. I'm not going to call any, any more method functions. So it will not going to create the loop once again. So it will simply print the value of sum and the loop will be ended. If I go and run this program, it should print the series sum. It is 210. I'm not that expert in mathematics. So you can check if the value is correct or not. But if it is printing the correct series, so it should print the correct sum as well. Okay, I hope you got this point. So if I go to the next one, that is topic two. And in this chapter, we will try to um, check the programs we have done in for application. So we had done this type of program in chapter 3.3 for application chapter. But there we have solved this using for loop. But this time, we will try to solve all those programs without for loop. And this time, using recursion. So suppose the first program is something like this, enter a number and find its factorial. So what does it mean by factorial? Factorial means if I enter five, it should be one into two into three into four into five. It should be 120 like that. So what I can do, I can simply enter the number. I can take the number from user, enter the number I can write. So I can pass in and with, uh, extra value that will hold the product. I'm not passing zero because a zero cannot hold the product because if you multiply anything with zero, it will become zero. So zero is fine for the sum, but for product, I have to pass one. Okay, it is a common uh, concept actually. So suppose here I'm, I'm taking one variable called P, P for product say, last time it was sum, sum, sum was taking as zero, but this time product will take as one. So now the same thing until n becomes one, I am iterating this thing. I am passing n minus one and with product, I am doing like P into X. And at the end, I am trying to print the product and it will print the factorial itself. Okay, it is not n, we do not have any n. It will be until X becomes one. So if I run this, okay, first let me explain. Let me show you the dry run what I'm doing. So what I'm doing now, I am passing math. Suppose n is given by user and it is five, say. So I am passing five and one. So five means it will be received by x and one will be received by p. So for the first time inside the math function, what it is doing, it is calling another time math. It is passing x minus one means five minus one. It is passing four and one into X means one into five. Next turn, what it is doing for the next turn, next iteration, it is calling the math function once again, because a, the value of X is four here. And this is one into five means five. It is in P. So what it is doing, it is X calling X minus one means four minus one. And P into X means five into four. So that means it is passing 20 and three. So this three will be received as X for the next iteration and 20 will be received as P for the next iteration. So what it is doing next, it is simply doing X minus one, that is three minus one and 20 into three. So that means three minus one means it is passing two and 20 into three means it is passing 60. So in the next turn, the value of X will be two and the value of P will be 60. So take a look. Meanwhile, we are collecting the products inside the P. So now next turn, it will pass X minus one. You can see here, 
it is x minus one and p into x. So obviously it will take some time for you to have those idea. But if you can understand it correctly, it is doing the same like for loop. It is just iterating from x to one and keep collecting the value of x inside p. So now this time it will be x minus one again, two minus one and 16 to two, p into x. So this value will be one, two minus one, one and 16 to two means 120. And it will be received as x and it will be received as p. So next turn, uh, what is written? Yeah, x is greater than equals to one. Yeah, x is still greater than equals to one. So I can write something with one minus one, x minus one and p into x means 120 into one. So for the next turn, it will pass zero and it will pass 120 into one, 120. So in next turn, next iteration, x, the value of x will be zero and the value of p will be 120. So now it is checking x is greater than one. No, x becomes zero. So if for the first time, it will go into the else block and it will print the value of p. So value of p is now 120. So it will print the factorial successfully. And that is how we are collecting the factorial. So obviously it requires some practice. I have already gathered some of the programs in the exercise. So you can have a look there and you will be getting a good idea of how recursion works. If you are not able to solve anything, if you are getting some problem, just let me know via mail or via comment section. I will try to provide you the exercise solution. But here you can see it is successfully printing the, uh, the factorial value. So now, meanwhile, in the mid of the session, let me share another thing. What is the advantage of uh, using recursion? So if I draw something, so suppose uh, this is a circle, this is some program, and that is being, suppose uh, it is a scope of for loop. For loop can solve this kind of program. Recursion can solve a bigger number of programs. So recursion can solve a bigger number of set. Okay, so this is can this can be solved by recursion. So whatever problems that can be solved by for loop that can also be solved by recursion. But there are few programs that we will I will show you in further classes. There are few programs that can be solved by only recursion. For loop is not able to solve those kind of problems. So that is the advantage of using for loop. Uh, that is the advantage of using recursion. And that is why we are learning recursion. So that is the advantage. So what is the disadvantage? Recursion always gives a pressure to memory. So compiler has to remember all these iterations. So in, in it is, I have provided the value five only. If the value is much bigger, it will create all these impressions into the memory. So compiler has to need to track all those. So which function is calling which function. So this is an overload to the compiler. So that is a disadvantage. Okay, so advantage is recursion can solve a bigger set of problem than for loop. Whatever problems can be solved in for loop, we can solve the same in recursion, but the vice versa is not true. There are few problems that can only be solved by recursion. I will show that. Uh, in our third class of recursion, but for the time being, our our goal is to solve all the programs of for loops using recursion. Okay, so if I go into the next program, suppose it is asking for sum of digit. So what is sum of digit? Suppose someone pass one forty five, so it should print ten. Ten means one plus four plus five. That is ten. So if I go to this program. And this time I want to collect sum, so I will be passing zero. And I will store all the sum into this variable. So suppose I am collecting zero inside sum, and what I'm trying to do, I will keep iterating this until the x becomes zero. And every time I will be passing x by 10 and sum equals to sum plus x percentage 10. If you are confident enough on for loops, for loop programming, you can find a similarity in for loop as well. If you can remember in the for loop, I was doing something like I was writing some condition like I greater than zero or X greater than zero. And every time it is incrementing or decrementing like I equals to I by 10. And inside the loop, I am doing something like this sum equals to X percentage 10 or sum equals to I percentage 10. 
so it has a similarity if you are really means looking if you are really passionate about the programs if you have a good idea of for loops you can find that similarity so again when everything ends i will print some so now let me explore this part only so what is happening suppose if i'm if i'm passing 145 and 0 145 and 0 suppose user has entered 145 and passing 0 with 145 and this will be termed as x and this will be termed as sum so what i'm doing x is greater than 0 obviously so I'm, what i'm doing for the next iteration i'm sending 145 x by 10 145 by 10 and sum plus 0 plus 0 plus 145 percentage 10 i am sending this so 145 by 10 it means 14.5 but in, in if it is in integer we cannot store 0. 0.5 so i can pass 14 only for the next turn 145 percentage 10 i'm getting the last digit and i'm looking for some of the digits so by 145 percentage 10 i'm getting 5 if you divide 145 with 10 you we will get remainder as 5 so 0 plus 5 i am sending 5 so i can fetch the last digit of this number from 145 i can successfully fetch 5 so i have already stored that inside the sum variable so for the next run x will be 14 and sum will be 5 so again x is greater than 0 obviously so it will further call itself means it math function will call another math function means it will call itself and it will be calling with x by 10 means 14 by 10 and sum plus if i can check the highlighted line sum plus x percentage 10 that means sum plus 145 percentage 10 so not 145 now x is 14 so 14 percentage 10 so now i'm looking for another digit so 14 percentage 10 means 4 and i will get the second digit of this number 145 so i will get 4 and sum the value of sum is 5 so 5 plus 4 here and here 14 by 10 means 1.4 that is 1 so for the next turn i will pass 1 and 9 okay it was the same concept we used in a for loop as well try to solve this program first in for loop then it, it will be more clear to you first try to solve this program in for loop next turn i will do like math 1 by 10 1 by 10 means 1 by 10 first let me write otherwise i'll be confused sum plus sum plus one percentage 10 so sum means it is nine so one percentage 10 means it is one so nine plus one it, it means 10 so i have gathered all the digits together and here one by 10 means 0 0.1 that is zero so next turn the value of x is not greater than zero so it will print the sum and it will print the sum as 10 so 145 if i enter 145 the sum of the digit is 10. So if I compile and if I run, suppose if I enter 145, let me enter 145 and it should print 10 as output. So now, are you able to understand this right? And obviously you need some practice, but if you are confident on for loop, so in for loop as well, we are doing something like this, i equals to x, i greater than zero. If I try to find the program for sum of digit, if you can remember, I have also show that in class 3.1, I was doing something like this, sum equals to sum plus i percentage 10. So I'm doing the same, I am implementing the same logic. Every time I'm, I'm collecting i percentage 10 and putting that inside sum. And for the next turn, I am changing the value of i as i by 10. So I'm doing the same here. I am changing the value like x by 10 for the next turn and inside sum i'm just adding x percentage 10 x percentage 10 is fetching the digit for me so just first try to write the program in for loop the similar logic will be used here but we will not going to use for loop again so we will be doing that using recursion but the concept will be same anyhow we have to fetch the number in a same way by percentage 10 we will fetch the digit and for the next run, I will pass by 10 value. Okay. So again, let me show you another example. So if the things will be clear. Uh, so enter a number and find it is prime number. So prime number was another big program in for application. So if I 
try to do that using uh, recursion, how to solve that. So I will say in the end, and what was the uh, definition of prime number? Prime number, for prime number, it cannot be divisible by any number between two and n minus one. All the numbers, if it is prime or non-prime, all the numbers are divisible by one and itself. So if I take two examples like seven, suppose let me take an example of seven, that is prime number. That is also divisible by one and seven. Nine, which is a not, not prime, non-prime number, that is also being divisible by one and nine. So obviously, I mean, I mean, I'm not explaining the definition of prime number. You already know that probably. So me, what is my purpose? My purpose is to divide that number x with the numbers between 2 and n minus 1 or x minus 1 here. So in case of 7, I will try to divide 7 with all the numbers between 2 to 6. For 9, I will try to divide 9 with all the numbers between 2 to 8. So here, for that reason, I have to pass 2. Believe me, those programs I have not memorized. So after practicing all those things, it will be clear to you as well. Now, if you can just look back and if you feel like, okay, we have done the programs on string, we have done the programs on matrix, we have done the programs on array. Now you will be thinking like, okay, array and matrix was far more simpler than this recursion because you have already done that and it is your first class in recursion. So do not be worried, just try to solve all the problems, just try to check the different application, try to solve the exercise and it will be clear to you after five or six days. Okay, after five or six classes, when I will be showing you some other parts of Java, then this recursion will also be clear to you. So now let me proceed and let me receive those value inside the function. So n will be received as x or let it be n itself. And here I will receive two inside i. So I will keep iterating this thing until the value of i is less than n until the value of i is less than n, until it reaches to 7. So in case of 7, I should iterate between 2 to 6. It shouldn't reach to 7. I will divide it to from 2 until 6. So whenever it will reach n, it will be ended up. So that's why I have written some logic like i less than n. But first, let me show you what, what I can do here. Obviously, I will explain. I will show the dry run. So if somehow I can divide in with i, then our job is done. Simply our job is done. I can simply say, okay, it is not prime. Simply. If it is not divisible by i, then I, I will go to this else block. Then I will try to divide the same number in with 3, means i plus 1. First, first time I am trying to divide that with 2. If it is not divisible by 2, I will try to divide by 3. Next time it is not divisible by 3, I will try to divide by 4 accordingly. So somehow if I'm not divisible, it is not being divisible by any of this number and the value of i reached to n, then I will go to the else block and I can simply say it is a prime number. I cannot, I was not able to divide it by any of the numbers. So I can say it is simply prime. That's why I, I, I couldn't divide it by any of these numbers. So if I compile and if I run first this program and then I will explain the dry, dry run. First, let me insert uh, seven, say. So it should print prime. If I enter nine, it should print non-prime. Let me enter nine, it should print not prime. If I enter eight, eight is simply divisible by two for the first run itself. So it will also say not prime. So let me show you the dry run for all these numbers. So if I enter 8, what will happen? If I enter 8, then I am sending math. I am sending 8 and 2 into this. I'm passing 8 and 2. 8 will be received as uh, n and 2 is being received as i. So first time it is checking 2 is less than 8. Yes, of course. 8 is divisible by 2. Yes, 8 is divisible by 2, simply. So I will print not prime. The program is ended because I'm not going to call any more math function. It is not calling itself once again. So the loop will be ended and it will print a message like not prime. That's all. 
it is it will happen in case of eight now if i provide nine what will happen in case of nine first it will check two less than nine yes two less than nine nine is divisible by two mm, no nine is not divisible by two then try to divide it with n and i plus one that means next turn i will pass obviously i will pass nine and i will pass three so next turn three is less than nine yes nine is divisible by three answer is yes and in the next turn it will show not prime so nine is also going into that direction that is not prime so now next turn next number seven let me pass seven and two so two is less than seven yeah two is less than seven seven is divisible by two no pass the next value so next run it will pass seven and three again next turn seven is divisible by three no seven is not divisible by three so i will pass seven and four next turn seven is divisible by four no seven is not divisible by four so pass another time seven and five seven is divisible by five no seven is not divisible by five so pass seven and six so seven is divisible by six next turn no so pass for the next turn so it is seven and seven so this time it will be stopped here it is saying i less than seven seven is less than seven no i reach to the value i have reached to the value of n that is seven so it will go into the else section and it will print prime. It will say, okay, I have tried dividing with all the numbers between two to six, but it is not going to divide. So finally, I arrived at seven that is equal to N. So I cannot divide it anymore. So I have tried all the numbers. So it will go into the else block and it will print prime. That's all. If I compile and if I try to run this program, okay, I have already done. But again, if I show you, if I enter seven, Internally, it has tried for all the numbers to divide. It is not divisible by, by any of those numbers. So it will directly go into the else block and it will, it will show prime. I hope you get this idea. Okay. So I hope that's all for this class. I We, we can see a good amount of uh, example in our uh, exercise. If you try to solve the exercise, it will be having some more good examples, some more good requirements, you can go through that. And even whatever problems we have already solved with for loops, all the problems, whatever the problems are, whatever we have solved using for loop, that we can solve now using recursion as well. If you are not able to solve any one out of them, just let me know. All of them should be solved by recursion right now. So if I go to our, uh, our group, if you go to the album, there will be an album called, all the links are provided in the uh, description section of this class. So just go to this album, Coding Exercise Basic, and there will be one chapter called uh, uh, called uh, Recursion somewhere here. Yeah, Recursion here. So you can go through this. Remember, do not check any program from internet because in internet you can find something like, uh, they have written something like return. So we have not done it yet. Today, all the programs we have done using void type of function we have using we are using void type of function so in the next class uh, in the next class of the recursion i will show you how to return values and how we can solve the same set of programs using using returning something but for the time being we are doing it as it is the initial class of recursion we will try to solve everything with void so all the problems you, even you can you can do something beyond of this exercise as well all the for loop problems can be solved in this way. If it is not, let me know. This program cannot be solved in recursion. Just let me know. But I'm saying all the programs, programs can be solved. So this is a good amount of exercise. You can go through all of this and you will be able to solve all the programs here using recursion. Do not use for loop. Just only use recursion. Okay. So that's all for the day. You can take a screenshot of these links or you can, all the links will be available in the detail section of this class as well all right best of luck practice all of those and let me know bye